The following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody. Welcome to the show. Wow. It's me, Matt Slick. Listen to Matt Slick Live. Man, I'm going to tell you. Was rushing at the last minute, had stuff going on, and uh, I'm laughing about it. Whoa, okay. So if you hear me breathing, it's because I literally was hustling. Hey, you know what? The Lord's work, I'll tell you. It's good stuff. All right. Hey, look, folks, if you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 877 207 I'd love want to hear from you. So I was having a discussion today uh, with oneness, not oneness, but Unitarianism. And uh, so generally speaking, generally speaking, what I do when I have discussions with people, I try to really be patient, really be polite. But I've had this discussion with one particular guy who is now working uh, hard against the doctor of the Trinity, and he's te- denying that Jesus Christ is God in flesh uh, and, and other things. So, you know, you have to call him a heretic for what he is. And I was going through some discussions and having uh, discussions uh, about that very thing. And that's what I was doing and uh, was exposing uh, I just really I hammered him. I was exposing to a, a discussion room the inconsistencies with his Unitarian position with God, and it doesn't work. It's incoherent. I was showing it, and uh, that's what I was doing. So there you go for that. And uh, me, yeah, it's my thing. I enjoy doing that kind of thing. So, by the way, if you want to give me a call, all you got to do is dial eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six, and. Um, so there you go. Whew. Boy, I, I was rushing. I mean, I was rushing. And I get a kick out of it because I like doing a lot of things, and sometimes I multitask. All right, all right, all right. That's good enough of that stuff. Um, if you're a first-time uh, listener, uh, this is a Christian apologetic show. We defend the Christian faith, and I answer questions on issues of the Bible, politics, evolution, UFOs, the occult, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Unity, Baha'i, Islam, all kinds of things, Eastern Orthodoxy, and deal, I hope, death blows to the false doctrines that are out there. The Scripture is the final authority, and that's what I use as the Word of God. The final authority is the Scriptures. And, um, in fact, I was in two discussion rooms today discussing. I'm going to go through something with you uh, while hopefully you guys are going to give me a call. Is the issue of tradition and Scripture, because there are groups that teach that tradition is equal to Scripture, and that sacred tradition, oral tradition, is equal to the Word of God. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, will teach that uh, you have to believe in the magisterium uh, and that the inspired Word of God is not only the written, but it's also the verbal tradition that's given down to the uh, descendants or the authority of the apostolic succession, the apostles, and and things like that. So here's something that I bring up that uh, I discuss with them, because they're going to say, now get this, they're going to say, People do this. They're going to say, well, you look, Matt, um, we have sacred tradition. We believe that there are truths that are manifested that are not revealed in the Word of God. I said, really? Not in Scripture. Okay, that's right. And I say, well, where are these things? Well, they're in our tradition. All right, so they're in your tradition. So what the Catholics are saying is... That tradition, I'm going to find this and read some stuff from them. I'm going to show you something out of Scripture, because I think it's important. That tradition is, to them, is both Scripture uh, and, uh, and what is, well, Scripture to them is tradition, the oral tradition, and also the written word. So is that the case? Is that uh, true? Well, the answer is no, it's not. Why do they say that? They say it because they want to submit the Word of God to their church and their church authority. So, oral tradition is a form of tradition in the Roman Catholic Church where one thing is spoken and handed down to another inside the Roman Catholic Church, and so they therefore then know these things and will reveal them as being true. For example, the Assumption of Mary. 
that she was assumed into heaven and didn't physically die. Or they'll say that she was born without sin. Well, how do you know this? Because that's a tradition of the apostles. Well, how do you know it's true? Because the apostles said it, and they pass it down to their apostles, their disciples, and their disciples, and their disciples, into the Roman Catholic Church. And we have that, because we are the true church. Blah, blah, blah. All right, now. What I'm going to do is read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read the first five verses. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or word, object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Whoa! So that means he was... No, oh, I got... The neighbor kids, I got to close the window and do that during the break. That's what the screaming is way about. Yeah. Just little girls out playing out in the yard, having a good time in, in the spring here. Hope you guys can't hear that, but uh, I'll close it during the break. And so, notice what's happening here. It says, when I was telling you these things, telling is speech. That means oral, oral tradition. So the Catholic Church says that once something is spoken, it's not necessarily written down, but it's spoken and then transmitted. This is exactly what Paul is telling them. He says, I was telling you these things. And notice what happens here. Paul the Apostle himself was giving them the word, giving them the oral proclamation. They were getting it wrong right away. Right away. Here we have the people of Thessalonica. Paul is telling them these things. Are there disciples there? Of course there are. Are there Christian disciples? Of course there are. The people who were Christians? Of course. And yet, when they heard from Paul himself, they were getting it wrong. And Paul had to write scripture to correct them. Why? Because the oral tradition wasn't sufficient. It's right there in scripture. And I brought this out before. I've brought it out and, and shown people that there's a problem with the oral tradition. This is one of the things I show. This is Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's uh, get to the phones. If you want to give me a call, we have four open lines, eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Patrick from North Carolina, welcome here on the air. Hello, Matt. Hi. I um I called in the other day and was asking you a question about Matthew twenty eight eighteen. Okay. on Jesus having all authority in heaven mm -hmm. and on earth. Um, mm -hmm. Was that authority given to Jesus by the Father or God? Yes. Well, the Father is God. He's called God. And uh, when Jesus is on earth in the incarnate form and all of that, uh, when he prays to, he's praying to the Father because he's under the law. And so that's why he would speak about the Father. Okay, okay so if it's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is the Trinity... Does is God the fourth part of this the Trinity? No, God is a Trinity. Okay. Okay. So then, who has the most authority in heaven and earth? Jesus said the he Trinity. Was, he said he was given authority because he was made under the law for a little while lower than the angels. So he was in that position of humility, and so God the Father gave it to him. Okay, that's what. So Jesus has more authority than the Father didn't say that does it why, why would you say that if the text doesn't say that well, why, would says, you try and, why would you try and make a problem that the text doesn't say well it says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me which is jesus mm -hmm. so that means he's got authority over the father oh so when it says all authority that means god the father doesn't have any authority left because he gave it to the son so how about the holy is spirit what, does he have any authority hold on a sec hold on is that what you're saying? That when God the Father gave the authority to the Son, that God the Father no longer had any authority? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just, I'm saying that... Okay, so to... hold on. I asked you if that's what you were saying. He said no. So then when God the Father gave the Son authority, then the Father still has authority, right? Right. Um, 
Well, I guess then they all three have the authority. Okay, we're talking about the Father and the Son. You brought up this issue of the authority in Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen. So I'm asking you questions about this. If I ask you questions okay. about what it is you have brought up, and then you avoid the very issue you brought up, then there's a problem. And not with me, but with you. So I'm asking you questions about it. So you've already agreed that the, all the authority was not removed from the Father, but that the Father and the Son both have authority. Would you? Are you agreeing with that? No, because Jesus okay. has all authority. Nobody else has it but Him. Okay, so the Father According doesn't have any authority? So all, the Father doesn't have any authority. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's my question is, is maybe the I'm, oneness is correct. There's God I'm and asking Jesus you, are the same thing. Are you saying that the Father doesn't have any authority? Well, I'm are saying you that, saying? Okay. Can you please I'm answer the question? Are you saying that God the Father doesn't have any authority if all authority has been given to the Son? Well, that's Are you saying that? How can God have any authority if he gave it all to the Son? Okay, I just hung up on him, folks. Now, you notice see what happens here is I'm asking a specific question several times. He doesn't answer the question. I've had thousands of encounters over the, the decades uh, with individuals who just refuse to answer a simple question based on their theological or logical position. All he has to do is say, no, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have any authority. Okay, then we move on. That's all. And we just move on to the next statement. Okay, now what are you saying then? And he can't even get to that point. The reason this is important is because you've got to understand that if a person holds a position, there are ramifications to that position, and we can ask questions about the position. Now, sometimes people can say, well, you know what? I, I haven't thought of that. I need to think it through. I'm not sure. That's fair. But when I ask a very detailed question, and uh, then he hems and haws and backtracks on the same thing, and he doesn't answer, then my experience has just shown that the conversation continues in the same vein, where nothing gets addressed. He asks questions, he doesn't answer, he asks another question, and nothing occurs. And that's just not conducive to a good conversation. So, bye-bye, you know. I just ask people, please answer questions. I answer questions, and and you know, let's go back and forth. Uh, that's that's respectful, I think. We have four open lines. If you want to give me a call, eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Let's get to Julie from South Carolina. Julie, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Um, I'm hoping you can help me. I entered into a spiritual conversation with one of my friends. Okay. And you really sparked my interest in predestined mm -hmm. election. Okay. So I, I guess I'm I'm not struggling. I, I know that the word of God is the word of God and I'm I'm kind of just trying to understand and maybe there aren't things I'm supposed to understand. Anyway, so predestined election when it comes to free will and mm -hmm. how all of that kind of intertwines. Sure, no problem. So at all. Let me explain it. Maybe you can help me out. Yes, please. Sure. Free will means that we're free to make choices. And we, we, are, we make them. We make them in a manner that's consistent with our nature. And the reason I say that is because God has free will. And he can only do which is good, because that's his nature. We don't want to define free will from a human perspective and say that's what true free will is. And it wouldn't apply to God. So... We can choose to sin and not sin, but God can only choose to sin. I mean, oh boy, I hate when I do things like that and I say stupid oh. things that come out wrong. You know, I, you could, somebody could just be at a collection of the times where I put my foot in my mouth and put it together and say this stuff. So uh, anyway, I, I messed up, of course. We'll be right back after this, okay? And we'll get to this and I'll explain it some more, okay? Sorry about that. Hey, folks, please hold on. We have four open lines. And if you want to continue to listen to this heretic, please... Please do. We'll be right back after these messages. It's Matt Slick Live. Taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Julie, are you still there? I am. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Let's try it again. Free will means you can choose without being forced. We'll just leave it at that, okay? Without being forced, okay. make a choice, okay? Now, when God elects, what that means is he chooses people. That's what election means. 
And there are different words for elect and choose and chosen and the word church. So I'm going to pronounce them in Greek and listen to the first syllable of each. Eklektas, eklegamai, eklege, ekklesia. The word church is ekklesia. We're the called out ones. All the world deserves damnation. We all fell in Adam, Romans 5.19. 1 Corinthians 15.22, Romans 5.18. We all deserve damnation. What God did yeah. is he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4, that we'd be holy and blameless. He chose certain ones to be that. Those who would be holy and blameless are going to be the saved ones. The unbelievers aren't holy and blameless. They're dying in their sins. So God, from all eternity, chose us. And he predestined the ones he chose. He worked in their lives and in circumstances to bring them to the faith. And then at the time of his choosing, he grants that they believe, Philippians 1.29. And he grants them repentance, yeah. 2 Timothy 2.25. And he has that our work is the work of believing in Christ. It's actually God's work. This is the work of God that you believe on whom he has sent, John 6.29. We're still free. So when we choose, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. So That's when right, we no. choose mm -hmm. Christ, and and we accept Him as our Savior, that could not have happened unless God chose us first. Correct. Correct. That's absolutely correct. Okay. You see, the, 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 I'm sorry. You're, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Try it again. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I was just. I, I I'm just fascinated by this because it's, you know, you, that is the case. And why would we go, like, what about those, and I know this probably has been asked before, what, and what purpose is it that we go and we, we go and try to preach the gospel to people on islands that have never heard of Jesus? Because if God is already... Mm -hmm. um, because we don't know how God elects. We don't know how he has made that choice. We don't know, here, let's see if I can say this. We don't know that God has, by his ordained will, used free will creatures redeemed, that from eternity he's decreed that they make these choices by which he uses to choose what he's done because it's his decree to do so. It, it gets tough. We know on a simple level that God tells us to. And for some strange reason, when we preach a lot, more people get saved. There is somehow, mm -hmm. some way, an interaction I don't know what that is. I don't know how it is. I know that God elects people from the foundation of the world. I know that. But I also know that the more we preach, the more people are saved. Now, how that works, I can't tell you. It's above my pay grade. So what I do is, <laughs> it is. You know, As a friend of mine said, Bill McKeever said this. I like to give him the credit where it's due. Bill McKeever from Sandy, Utah there. He says, we're, in the, uh, we're not in production. We're in sales. We're the ones who try and convince, and God is the one who produces. So we're not in production, we're in sales. So what we do is give an answer, and we go and preach and teach, and then we just trust that God has got it all worked out from eternity past, and yet the more we preach, the more we get saved. And I believe that, which is why I witness a great deal. I probably witness and teach more than most are every Christian. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying, I am doing, except for maybe right. Christians in seminaries and things like that, teaching. You know, I have the opportunity to do radio every day and write articles, and I'm on debate rooms a lot. And so I could do this a great deal. And that's all I'm saying, more than the average Christian. And, and yet I believe God predestines and elects because the Bible says so. And it doesn't stop me, right. it encourages me because mm -hmm. oh, I don't know how God does yeah, it. But Okay. Yes. Well, you're a blessing. I'm I'm reading um, "Chosen by God" by R.C. Sproul. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know if you've read it. It's just fascinating, and I'm just yeah. so drawn to this topic. And the more I tell people, the more it's, it's just spiritual conversation. But there's, there's obviously things I just don't know, and I'm like, yeah, that's a really good question. I need to call that. Like, <laughs> well. You know, I've been discussing this, teaching on it, trying to answer objections and things on this topic for, uh, I want to say, 30 years, maybe longer. Yeah, 30 years. Wow. And um, 
Hmm. It certainly doesn't mean I'm right, but I, you know, I, I've had a lot of questions asked, and and um, you know, I like to think I have some answers. And I'm just going to tell you, maybe I'm wrong about some things. And I'm not just saying it, giving those words lip service. No, I believe it. Maybe I'm wrong. And I just oh, you know, I ask God, you know, show me where I'm wrong, teach me where I'm wrong, but by the Word. But what I see in the Word is, you know, Ephesians one four. He says. It says uh, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Okay, he chose us. He says he predestines us. Uh, that's what it says in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Okay, he works all things after the counsel of his will, Ephesians 1, 11. He turns the heart of the king where he wishes it to go, Pro- uh, Proverbs 21, 1. We can't come to him unless it's granted from the Father, John six sixty five. We're born again not of our own will, John 1, 13. He causes us to be born again. Uh, excuse me, he grants that we believe, Philippians 1, 29. These are verses I know, and I know them well, mm. and I, I can understand them all, so to speak, simultaneously. When you you know, I have to go consider that one. I've been doing this for so long. I'm like, okay, how do they all fit? And my conclusion is this: God's in absolute control. Nothing surprises Him. He's ordained everything that comes to pass. Yet at the same time, what we do somehow makes a difference because from all eternity, God's ordained that it does. But that's what that's what right. I believe. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that does make it makes sense the way that you say that for sure. I wish when I'm in conversation, I can say it like that. Um, do you have time for just one more question as it pertains sure. to this? Sure, really fast. Go ahead. Okay, what about the story of Job? <laughs> what about the story? I, of Job? I often wonder how it fits okay. into the why, um, and maybe why what? I mean, obviously it's. Uh, why did God allow Satan to persecute him? Yes, when his faith was so strong. Because it was for us, and ultimately, uh, right. to demonstrate the truth of who God is. See, Job was righteous in one level, but not in another. And God knew him, and Satan challenged him. And and Job was right, he was vindicated. And it is a, a book that teaches wisdom, and there's hidden things in there. There's different philosophical positions that are taught by the different opponents to Job, which I need to go through and study that. And that idea was given me by somebody, and I have to go through and, and look. But there's a lot okay. going on there. Okay. And so it's more than just, why would God let him be uh, persecuted? For what? Well, God does everything mm-hmm. for a reason, and we could offer a list of reasons mm-hmm. for the greater glory of God to humble Job even further, to give him a greater reward later on, uh, to demonstrate the truth and the power of God even over Satan, to show the limits of Satan. There's all kinds of things that are in there. Okay? We've got to break. Got to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate you. God God bless you. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. 877-207-2276. Give me a call. We'll be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Let's get on the line with Boyd from Greensboro, North Carolina. Welcome. You're on the air. Thank you, Matt. I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on a guy that comes on TV, Les Feldick. Yeah, um, I've been hearing some more and more of his names come up. And uh, I, I don't trust him. So, but I'm going to just say that for now. I probably need to uh, do a, a bit of research on him. And I think I will just because you called up about this and because his name's come up before. And I finished another uh, person's research. I got to expand it on Andy Stanley. And then I'm going to, I think I'll just do one on Les Feldick. But uh, I looked at his statement of faith during the break. And his statement of faith is pretty good. Now, that doesn't mean that he's teaching everything right, but I've heard enough warning uh, statements that um, I, I'm just concerned. So he believes in the gap theory, and which is ridiculous. Uh, from what I understand that the earth was flooded twice, he says that. And um, that Adam, um, Adam didn't want to lose Eve, and that's why he chose to fall. Uh, things like this, which are not in Scripture. So when people start doing things like that, you, you've got to be very, very careful. And um, 
then we have uh, various things. I won't get into it right now, uh, but I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna start to. Uh, I'll, I'll probably start working on it tonight. Get a, a more comprehensive uh, analysis of this guy because there's a lot he's producing, and I've got to, I got to do that. So that's all I know right now, and and I think um, I don't know if Charlie has stuff in the text that he makes it he does things. He studies things I don't study sometimes. And uh, I don't see anything. So that's what I'll do. Um, I'll, I'll do some research. Call back in, in next week, and let's see what I've come up with, okay? But for, for now, yeah, I would with, avoid it. When COVID started, that's when, you know, we were all shut in and couldn't get out, and I just ran across him across the TV. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely say he's a dispensationalist, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I couldn't find any problem with his... With yeah. his uh, the fact that he believes scripturally that we're saved by faith through yeah. grace, no doubt. If that's but, it, uh, he definitely does give his own opinion. Like you said, the gap theory: uh, okay. why Adam let the, I mean, why Adam sinned. And there's a lot of things, and he says, and he does clarify a lot of things by saying, okay. "Now this is my opinion," you know. All right. But sometimes when you step out and give your opinion, you get away from scripture. Yeah. Right? Well, I tell you what, um, and, and anybody else who's listening, if you have any information on him that is worth looking at, any concerns, then what I'd ask you to do is give me the quote. If it's in a book, it's in a writing, it's in a web address, if it's in a, a audio, um, it, it provide that and say, go here and on page whatever, or here's the quote, or it's on this article here, or it's in this audio at 8 minutes and 17 seconds. Because sometimes people send me a two-hour video and go, here's where the quote is, and I'm just not going to listen to it. And so I need that, that help, because there's just so much to do. i got so much. But if, if people want to do that. But I will say, having looked at his, uh, his statement of faith, I couldn't. F- I scanned it. I couldn't find anything wrong with it. So that's good. But well, thank you, sir. You, you can have others who say some things that are good, but doesn't mean they are. And I, something in the back of my mind is just bothering me, and I don't know what it is. So, uh, but I don't want to say something inappropriate either. I, I don't want to exactly. you know, misrepresent him and say he's not a good guy if he is a good guy. So let me just do do some homework on him and call back uh, next week, and let me and let's see what I come up with. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. And thanks for calling. Goodbye. And thanks for bringing that up, to bring it to my attention. I need to do work on that. All right. Thanks a lot, buddy. All right. Let's get on the phone with, let's see who's next longest waiting person is, Nelson from Bakersfield. Hey, Nelson, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. God bless. Been a minute. Thanks. Hey, um, the verse, okay, I got a question about Exodus. Uh, verse on um, Exodus chapter six, verse three. Mm-hmm. How can I reconcile that verse with the very last statement in Genesis four in that chapter? Okay, Genesis Exodus six, where it says God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. And then you're saying in Genesis six, the last verse in Genesis six, or was it Genesis four? I forgot which one. Genesis four. Okay, the last verse in Genesis. Four, which the, says the to Seth. End of that verse, yeah. the end, second part of that. Verse. Yeah, it says he began to call on the name of the Lord there. Okay. Yeah, because on the other one it says that that uh, that God Almighty appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to them they did not know His name as Lord. Yeah. Okay, so, now I understand. So I, guess, um, I mean, yeah. now I understand the question. Yeah, so, because it says in Exodus 6, which is in the time of Moses, which is after Seth, um, yeah. and it says, but my name, Lord, my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I'm actually glad you brought this up, because I haven't had to deal with this thing, this issue, in 10 or 15 years. It's just, I just remember, I know what the answer is, but uh, it's just been so long, and I'm smiling because you're causing me to remember in which I like. It's, it's no big deal. So anyway, I'm, I'm thankful for that. So it says, then he began to call the name of the Lord. It looks like what's happening in the issue of Seth, he called upon the name of the Lord, called upon the name of Yahweh. Um, when it says uh, in Exodus 6, 
3, he says, God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Logically, we could say that he did not let himself be known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Lord, as Yahweh, as his name. We could say that because his name was not revealed officially until God uh, was talking to Moses in Exodus 3. So we know that, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were before then. But Seth was before that time as well. So it looks like what Moses did is this, he wrote in that Seth was calling on the name of the Lord. See, the call upon the name of the Lord is a generic phrase that means to pray to, to seek God. So he was doing that, and it looks like what Moses did was just backpedaled and put the name of God in there as that phrase that represents his trust and faith in the true and living God, even though he didn't know his name. That's one possibility. The other possibility is he did know his name. It was somehow revealed to him, and that it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that didn't know his name officially. That those are logical possibilities. Some are more satisfying than others. The one I lean to is that what Moses did when he wrote uh, Genesis is he uh, just inserted the phraseology as an idiomatic expression to call upon the name of the Lord means to seek the true and living God. And in the case of the word Lord Yahweh, call upon the name of, uh, it, it, that's what it is. And um, <clears throat> that he retroactively inserted it into the text as, as the, what they were doing to the true and living God. Okay. Okay, okay. Got it. Yeah, because um, I was seeing that was it uh, Tuesday, and I was like, huh, call in the name of the Lord. <laughs> and you see, it, it reminded me of what said in Exodus 6, 3. But good for you. See, these are the kind of questions you know, I think are great, because it does cause us to see and to think, and you're putting things together from different places. It means you're paying attention, and praise God. But yeah, I, I've had to deal with that before. And that's, that was the answer that, in my research, I came up with that it looks like it's a retroactive statement that uh, he uh, Moses put into the text to signify the phrase. Because it's not that he knew his name, but there's a phrase, to call upon the name of the Lord. And in some cases, we can wonder, does it mean that they had the actual name, or does it mean that they were calling idiomatically, the expression would say, calling upon God? and the name of God, as in the great being one. And so we don't know. And then there's also the issue that some may have had an idea of God's name before the time of Moses, when Moses, who was raised in the, the court of Pharaoh, wouldn't have known the name of Yahweh. And it could have been, there's some theories, I, you know, I would theorize, that the name of God could have been revealed elsewhere at earlier times, but he didn't know it, and they didn't know it until that time. So these are, there are several explanations that are possible. Okay? Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. And just for a um, little bonus <laughs> for the viewers, listeners, um, I was talking to a brother right now a little bit ago, and he was doing the study of names of the Bible, and he came across the name of Cain. And the definition of Cain means, there's two definitions, which means one is... Uh, demon and the other is dagger that was like mm. wow that was pretty interesting for me. I was like, wow. let's see let me That's... take a look <laughs> let me take a look let's see Cain and um, so here we go and it means uh, it occurs 17 times Kenite once eldest son of Adam Eve first murderer murderer tribe of which uh, Kenite possession doesn't, I don't see the definite uh, translation of it. Let's go look for some more research. But it's interesting. Got to go. There's a break. Okay, buddy. Okay. Call back again, man. All right. All right. All right Matt. Thank you very much. All right. Hey, everybody. We have three open lines. If you want to give me a call, 877 207 2276. We'll be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Everybody, welcome back to the show. We have free open lines, 877-207-2276. Nate from California, welcome. You're on the air. How are you, Matt? Hey. Hope everyone, um, everyone in the family is doing good. God bless. Well, um, we're hanging in there. What do you got? I'm... 
Life isn't easy, believe me. Mm-hmm. Um, I called you and I was the last one, so you told me to call today. Um, so I'm a person that has to. Um, what is it that um, I, I, I studied it, but then I forgot about it? Um, um, this uh, mm-hmm. friend of mine, it was a very good friend of mine, he believes that we are small gods, you know, like, not God, but just yeah. young gods. And then it, <laughs> it made me remind me of um, the book of Hank Hanegraaff's of Christianity in Crisis. And I I didn't read it all, but I, read, I think I read part of it, mm-hmm. or li- listened to it. So what's your question, though? Um, I want to know what is it that they, how can I answer him correctly? That we are not gods or little well, gods. I'd say 4310, 446, 448, 455. No God created before God, no God created after God, doesn't even know of the inner gods. We're not little gods. When they go to Psalm 82 6, which says, You are gods, and Jesus quotes it in, in uh, John 10 34, it's a mockery of the unrighteous judges. So uh, these people are arrogant fools who raise themselves oh, so up yes, and say they're all gods. Yes, they are. Absolutely, yes, they are. Yes, they, yes, they are. Mm-hmm. They need to be corrected. But, all yes, right. I, do. I hope you... Can you, can you say those, those, those um, verses again so I can write them down later? Just go to Isaiah chapters 43, 44, and 45. And just read through those three chapters, and you'll see lots of verses in there that say that God's only one God, doesn't even know of any other. Those are three chapters that are just full of that kind of thing. It's good stuff, okay? All yeah, right. um, but that is God, but how about little God? There are no little gods. There aren't any little gods. Ben, this, this is in the Bible, I saw, as a matter of fact. No, I read some verses that says, um, you are a little god or something. No, that would be in the book of Deuterectomy or Second Moronicles. Okay? Mm. It's not there. All right? Okay. So, uh, so even though if it says in the Bible that you are a little god... It does not it say... Doesn't. It does not say anywhere in the Bible you're little gods. It doesn't say that. We are... That we will be little God, that we are little God. Okay, it never says anywhere in the Bible that we are little gods or will become gods. It's not there. It's not in Scripture. All well, right? The same thing um, Hank Hanegraaff says. You have to check it out. Yeah. Thank you. I you truly go. appreciate it, and I hope... Um, that everyone in your family gets better. Everyone Thank has pain. I'm epileptic. Um, I ask you to pray for me too. So, well, we have a prayer team, yes. and people are willing. Are uh, if they want, they can just email us, and uh, we have people who, are, who whose ministry it is to pray for people. That's what they do. So, it's a prayer. That is and, the best. Yeah, a To me, to me, it is great to be that Christian to pray for people who truly need it. Amen. Can I ask you one more question? Uh, Yeah, I was going to say, the address is prayer at karm.org and you can always get to us that. Anybody has any prayer needs? Okay, one more question. Okay. Um, Throwing um, the pearls out there, is it the pearls to the pigs? Because I have several friends who I tell them about Christ and stuff and they just don't want to hear it and isn't that like throwing the pearls to the, or Jesus said or someone I forgot I forget verses but um don't Matthew throw seven, the pearls six. to the right don't throw your pearls before yeah. swine it'll trample you under your feet right yeah it, so if I see them again and have a party with them don't mention the Bible at all or I can't tell you that you should not mention the Bible at all when you have a gathering of people I'm not going to tell you that but we have to be wise. Well, I wouldn't either, but, you know, hold, 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 for on, me, hold, 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 hold on, let me answer, okay? But you have to be wise, and when the right time is to bring up the truth of God's Word. You don't want to be offensive, and you don't want to be overbearing, but you don't want to agree never to bring up the gospel message. And then ask God for wisdom 
okay, when the right time is. Okay, that's what you got to do. Are you there? All right. Oh uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Right. I thank you very much. Okay. Um, I will call again for another question that I have, but I don't want to keep people waiting. Um, God bless. Okay. Um, keep it up, man. Keep it up. All right. All right, man. Well, God bless, buddy. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Let's get to Travis from North Carolina. Travis, welcome. You are on the air. Hey, man. How you doing, buddy? Doing all right. Hanging in there, by God's grace. So what do you got, buddy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I had a couple questions for you. Um, maybe maybe kind of a, I don't know, semi-big, but I didn't know if you had ever heard of uh, Ron Wyatt, archaeologist from, Mm-mm. you know, the 80s and 90s. Passed no. away in 99. No, I've not heard of him. And I was curious if there's anything with his message that would be legitimate and viable you know I just I don't know because I don't I don't know what he's what he's saying now I'm looking at the name and um, is this the guy that one of two guys who went and um, looked for no, this wasn't not Noah's Ark but uh, Noah's Ark yeah, he did. Yeah, the two other guys I'm thinking about was it wasn't Noah's Ark that they were looking at. They were looking for something else, and they apparently found it. It was the mount where he boasted uh, that he found the uh, Ark of the Covenant in I, Jeremiah's Grotto. Okay, underneath um, the, I guess, archaeology archaeologically he went under there, dug back in the 80s, and claimed to have found. Um, and I was far fetched. It was for me, and I just did he touch it? To, you know, try it. Well, apparently, and like I say, there's videos on YouTube. You know, this has kind of gotten me kind of spawned back into you know <laughs> trying to get myself right, you know, and do what I'm supposed to. Well, basically, found the blood dripping on the mercy seat of the ark in Jeremiah's grotto below Calvary. I know, I know that sounds crazy. Yeah, I, I would but, have. I, I don't but, know about that. And um, okay, that would be blood for four thousand years dripping. I, I, I you know, I, I'm not convinced of that at all. Well, you know, over. I don't know. He was just going on saying that, like, there were, um, you know, you get twenty four chromosomes from your mother, or twenty some chromosomes from your mother, but there was only one Y chromosome or one Y meaning that there were no other chromosomes from the father what does it got to do with Noah's Ark I'm, I'm, I'm waiting so what? well Here. he apparently found Noah's Ark in Turkey Noah's Ark State Park or something I know I know it's, it's far fetched I just didn't know if you'd ever heard of it and I won't I won't take your time I know well um I think I know what uh, is being looked at here. I've seen on the web, I've seen uh, this grotto or this area that looks like Noah's Ark. Yeah, that's exactly, I'm looking at a video from him to exactly what it, it is. And uh, I'm not convinced um, that a, a, a formation that looks like it. There's a phenomenon called pareidolia. Pareidolia occurs when you look into a cloud and you say, hey, look, there's a frog. There's a, a you know a guy carrying a log. <laughs> okay. And it's called pareidolia. Gotcha. And um, now I'm not saying that it's not the case, but we have to be careful with the issue of pareidolia when you see a, a formation. Now I'm looking at this, and I, it looks like a boat, and maybe it is. I'm just saying. What I've seen in this video, I'm not convinced. They would have to show an entrance and then a wooded structure inside. And I go, okay, now we're talking, you know. I, I'm just, I don't know if I've seen okay. that. And so I, I'm just asking, you know, just, just know. show. It, it's just something you'd have to dig into because the no pun intended. Um, and and like I say, I'm not I'm not 100 convinced, but you know, mm-hmm. it's just something that can help boost your faith. Like I say, I was listening to your show earlier. Um, I'm kind of what you would call fallen away Roman Catholic. I was born Methodist. Well, and uh, raised Methodist. Stay away from Catholicism. 
Okay, stay away from it. That's, you know, that's kind of what I'm feeling, especially with, you know, Revelation and all talking about what the um, the horns or whatnot, and there's one coming out. I'm, I'm you know, basically the church kind of doesn't teach, or the Catholic church, little c, doesn't really teach much about Revelation. But it talks about, you know, all of Rome and stuff like that. Yeah, and now you're jumping around from topic history. to topic, but uh, I'm trying to follow you. But uh, as far as the Ark okay. thing goes, I, I don't know if what he said is true. It's not been verified as far as I understand. Personally, I believe that the Ark is out there. I believe, I suspect it will be discovered and verified. It may have already been discovered and they're keeping it quiet. I, I don't know. I don't have any problem with either of those. I think they're logically possible. But I would... Uh, be okay. um, you know I'd be careful okay I'd be careful now gotcha. you said Methodist gotcha. did you go by any chance of the United Methodist Church yeah United yeah. Methodist I'm sorry yeah. yeah I was and that's where I'm at now okay, you um, need to get out of there you know my wife you need to get out of there the United Methodist get get out okay the United, United Methodist, Methodist Church it is uh, I would never recommend anybody go to the UMC and I would also recommend they get out Women pastors, women elders, promotion of homosexuality, inclusion of transgenders as being perfectly viable opera, operations of uh, homosexuals in clergy, things like this, exactly. get out. Exactly. Okay? Don't go there. Like I say, that's, you know, it was my home church. Like, I guess I'm still speaking or whatnot. But, I got gotcha. you. Um, don't go. It's not, a, it's not an issue here. You don't go to a false church. You just don't do it. I don't care if a lot of friends are there. You don't attend a false church. You don't support a false church. Here in Boise, the UMC church, uh, on a Sunday morning, had a Muslim preach from the pulpit to everybody. It's heresy. Okay. The woman yeah. pastor yeah. allowed it. Definitely. So another error. I passed out well, literature yeah, in front of their church. We have a, uh, mm-hmm. Luckily, we have a, you know, a, a male, you know, our Lord called 12 men, of course. Good. And then why is he then in a denomination that supports homosexual uh, pastors and women pastors? you got to ask him the question. Because I'd say, you, know, you got to better have a really good reason. If he says, I'm in here in order to witness to this denomination because it is going downhill and it's pagan. And he's a missionary in that context? Okay. But for the average Joe, don't go to a church like that. Don't go to a I church as women pastors kind of and well, you, you've got to figure something out. You've got to trust God. It's better to listen online to good preaching than attend a bad church in person. Okay? So right. you're not supposed to go to we, we got to go. Hey, sorry, God. It's better to go to a, a, a church online, uh, to watch online good sermons, than attend a bad church in person. Okay? Got to go, buddy. Hey, folks, we're out of time. May the Lord bless you by His grace. Be back on there tomorrow, and we'll talk to you then. Have a great night. Another program powered by the Truth Network.